Thank you, uh, Nilesh, for the invitation. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you, Victor, for the uh, introduction and Elizabeth and Andrew in advance for your comments. And thanks everyone for joining yet another Zoom call um, and being part of the discussion. I look forward to your questions and comments um, in Q&A. Um, what I wanted to do with my 25 to 30 minutes is try to give you a sense of where the book came from and what I think it's doing. And now that it's been uh, over a year since it's come out, some of the things I've been thinking about as limits or questions I have that, um, that persist for me. Um, so this uh, book emerged as a dissertation initially. It was written in a joint PhD program in African American studies and political science. And um, it took shape in the context of uh, what I took to be a kind of resurgent American imperialism. Uh, the prospectus uh, out of which the dissertation was written, you know, started with the provocation of the Libya intervention and what the Libya intervention signaled about sovereignty, about sovereign equality and non-intervention. And it really ar arrived from a sense that uh, the, what, what at the time had felt like a very exceptional moment of the Bush years and the war on terror really signals something more, something deeper, some a profound transformation of the international order that had to do with the diminution of sovereign equality and non-intervention as ideals, um, as framing ideals of the international order. I think related to this kind of more political context was a context in my own field of political theory in particular that had to do with the rise and emergence of a cosmopolitan political theory um, that tried to think of think through questions of how we might build political institutions beyond the nation state, how we might think about obligations, material uh, obligations to strangers or to non-national um, fellow human beings. And uh, in that context, there was there was a you know, a sort of normative celebration of the waning of sovereign inequality and, and uh, non-intervention as really, um, uh, you know, setting the foundation for a transformation of the international order, uh, uh, the emergence of a post-Westphalian world order. Um, I mean, much of this scholarship is really written in a normative vein, right? It's, it's, uh, a theoretical project of trying to think think beyond our contemporary confines. But one of the things I'm really interested in is, as a political theorist uh, who's, who's a very historically informed is to try and show the ways in which history informs political theory even when we're not doing history. So this very normative account of uh, cosmopolitanism I, I think emerges from a particular kind of historical vantage point, and that's a historical vantage point that stems from the problem of um, uh, European interstate European war and the legacy of the Holocaust. Um, so it's from that particular perspective or orientation around what the problem of the 20th century was that we get a cosmopolitanism concerned primarily um, with uh, you know, containing um, and constraining the state. Um, so here is an account in which the primary object of international relations and international politics is really to set us to create a set of limits uh, on the state and to do so either through forms of integration or through international law, particularly human rights law. Uh, so what I wanted to do in this book or is to try to point to a different set of dilemmas of the international order um, that I think emerge when we take seriously the problem of empire as the problem of the 20th century. And by that, I mean that, you know, when we think about the post-war post world order, this is a moment in which most of the world is not, is not, are not sovereign, right? It's a moment in which most of the world remained colonized. And so from the perspective is to try and think about what would be, um, how, how we might tell the story of international order and international institutions from the perspective of people who at its foundation were non-sovereign peoples, right? Who were struggling for independence. Um, I think also it's, you know, 
this is implicit in the book, it's certainly central for some of the figures I write about. It's a story that actually complicates the, the story of Europe, Europe as the space from which these questions emerge, because for a whole set of anti-colonial intellectuals, uh, including Du Bois, who I focus on in the book, but per perhaps most, um, you know, polemically in, in Amy Césaire in Discourse on Colonialism, made the point that the European crisis of the nation state in, in World War II was really a product, a consequence of the imperial world order. So it's not just that the problem of empire was the problem for and of the colonized people, but it was the problem for the world to solve, right? Um, and so it's a way of framing from that face of non-sovereignty, a way of thinking the world altogether. Um, so then, so this book then begins with the question, what, what, what vision of the world emerges when we make the struggle against empire <clears throat> our central starting point and our central preoccupation? And then I think this generated a second question for me, which was, what was the problem of empire? How was empire actually conceived by, by, by anti-colonial um, nationalists? And um, here I make one intervention, which is that the standard way we've conceived empire and the standard way we think nationalists conceived empire is a double, double one, uh, one of alien rule, by which we often mean that a, a metropolitan country directly rules a co colonized country. So Brit Britain ruling India or Britain ruling Ghana and Jamaica would be you know, the classic version. And that this structure of alien rule is um, coincides with the exclusion of the colonies from international society. So it's taken to be the case that they have no international standing, they have no international personality. Um, when empire is thought of in those terms, uh, its, its overcoming is registered primarily as one in which uh, the colonized people uh, overcome alien rule by creating a nation state and then transform themselves from being excluded colonies to included set, uh, um, you know, set states of the international order. I mean, this thesis is pro probably best associated with Headley Bull and Adam Watson's uh, The Expansion of International Society. So what I try to do, calling from um, primarily Black anti-colonial nationalists, and here my figures range from W.E.B. Du Bois, um, African-American, um, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, Ghanaian, George Padmore, C.L.R. James, um, Michael Manley, Eric Williams, so uh, two generations of uh, what I, what borrowing from Paul Gilroy, I call Black Atlantic intellectuals, um, is a story, a different kind of story of empire that emphasizes and focuses on a structure of unequal integration. Here, what really matters is not whether you're directly ruled by an um, empire or an imperial power, but a an international structure of hierarchy, and in particular by the late 19th century, a structure that's racialized in which you have unequal and subordinated status within international society. So I dramatize this question of um, international racial hierarchy by turning to what's taken to be the Wilsonian moment, the post-World War I moment in which self-determination first arrives on the scene as an international principle. And what I show there through this example of Ethiopia and Liberia is that is a structure in which you're independent but subordinated. Uh, you have what I call a burdened, a burdened membership within international society. Uh, I focus on these two cases because I think it produ they productively illuminate um, this uh, form of empire that doesn't require domination, but it's structured by this unequal standing. I also choose these two cases because the status of Black uh, nations, of African and Caribbean nations, Liberia, Ethiopia, and Haiti, were preoccupations of Black intellectuals in the 1920s and 30s. Um, I mean, the Nigerian nationalist Nandi Azikwe writes a whole book called Liberian World Politics. Um, 
Haiti is a kind of constant reference point uh, for African American thinkers. Uh, so this kind of analysis of racial hierarchy as a um, as a kind of structure of the world order is is for them kind of exemplified by these two cases. Um, but this period of the 1920s and 30s is also one in which um, uh, black anti-colonial thinkers uh, um, are are developing an account of of racial hierarchy that's 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 historically informed that takes the form of what Du Bois calls the global color line. So here, what's being racialized isn't sovereignty, as is the case with the Liberia and Ethiopia examples I highlight, but really and especially uh, labor and um, and the expropriation of black labor. So uh, this is a story that centers the transatlantic slave trade and new world slavery as the founding moment of the modern world. Um, uh, and it's one that traces the new imperialism of the late 19th century to that longer experience. So for Du Bois, for Padmore and others, um, the scramble for Africa in the late 19th century is a way of generating new forms of uh, new spaces and modes of uh, expropriating black labor. So their, the, their argument is that this, this is, on the one hand, it's historically sequential, right? That uh, in the emancipation is followed by this form of expansion into Africa, and that there's a structural continuity such that imperialism in the Atlantic world is constantly about the search for expropriation of labor. I'll say this very briefly here that I think it's it's worth thinking about this kind of argument against um, Hobson's or J.A. Hobson's argument or Lenin's arguments about the new imperialism uh, precisely because these are a set of figures who are concerned with the condition of racialized labor instead of the problem of surplus capital and its investments abroad. Um, so I think it gives us a different lens. So um, out of this kind of account of empire as an as international hierarchy as and as racial hierarchy in particular, this is the backdrop to what I call anti-colonial world making in the project. Um, it's this account of empire as as a process of unequal integration that leads nationalists um, to think beyond simply securing uh, the nation state and think about reforming and transforming the international order. Um, and I trace three ways that the, that that happens in the book. Um, so one is it's the legal, uh, legal strategy of universalizing the right to self-determination, ensuring that equality and independence are uh, universal rights within the, inter the new international order. The second is a political strategy, and this follows the legal claim to a right to self-determination. Here, the, here it's about how to overcome um, economic dependence. So you're independent, but you're a small state in the Caribbean or Africa, and you may be independent, but you're, you're still economically and politically subject. And here the strategy becomes constituting regional federations, um, the West Indian Federation, which exists briefly from 1958 to 62, and then um, and, and then in Africa, a sort of never realized project of forming a union of African states that ends up with the organization of African unity in the, um, uh, in 1963. I mean, I'll say I, I particularly like, I, I like this chapter in particular on the federations in part because it's a story of thinking institutionally about the question of internationalism. It's an attempt to create a, for, a political form for their internationalist aspirations. It's also one that it's a South-South uh, vision of, of, of how you might overcome the problem of international hierarchy. So whereas the right to self-determination directs itself at the UN and then the NIEO, which I'll talk about very briefly after this, are both fixated on the hierarchical relationship between uh, North and South. This project to me is a way of circumventing 
that for that situation by turning to one's neighbors. And I think it's really interesting. And I think it can be kind of juxtaposed to the models of federation that come out of the French empire, uh, which I can talk about in Q&A. And then the last project is the new international economic order, which is the economic feature of this new, this project of world making. And here it's to return to that space of hierarchy and to imagine it as a kind of division of labor, similar to the division of labor within nation states that can be rectified through forms of uh, redistribution um, that, that try to globalize the welfare state, I argue. So I wanna now just say, I think I'm okay on time. So I'll say a little bit about some of the takeaways and then some of the questions I have. So I think one takeaway of this analysis is um, that it, when, when we understand the project of decolonization um, against the backdrop and against the view of international hierarchy, even the right to self-determination, which is often taken to be simply an extension of a, a right to new states, a, that it conforms to and affirms, it's, it no longer looks like it just affirms and confirms the existing order, but it appears in, in a kind of radical light in two ways. One, I think, um, you know, I'm making the argument that sovereign equality was not the problem, it did not emerge from Europe and then get exported and universalized, but sovereign equality has always been a peripheral claim. It's been the peripheries of the international order that have advocated for and generated demands for sovereign equality. Um, and I think you can trace this in earlier moments with early decolonizers like Latin American states. Um, the other thing is that sovereign equality, as I try to show throughout the project, it, it's by the time uh, we get to something like the new international economic order, it's, it's radicalized in two senses. One, the idea that we're equal, all equal states generates the view that we all have the right to participate in the formation of international law. And two, that sovereign equality is also a demand for material equality um, and not just for formal or legal equality. Um, I think the book also opens up a way, a different way possibly of reading the crisis of the post-colonial world. Uh, you know, this is, a, this is in some ways a tra tragic story. Um, it's one in which the project fails both because of its internal contradictions and its external resistance. And I'm happy to say more about that. But I think one of the things I want to suggest is that we take the, if, if as I'm suggesting, decolonization was both a nation building and world making project, we have to take seriously the ways in which its failure is generated and enacted at those two levels, um, such that we might read the failure of anti-colonial nationalism and uh, the post-colonial state more generally, not just as an internal failure, uh, um, but one that's really enacted in, the, in, the, in between and in the context of a particular kind of uh, a state formation, um, so that both so that the failure is enacted at both levels and that failure at one level informs failure at another level. Um, so it's a way of thinking about this, the experience of a failure in a layered way. Um, and then I just want to say one other suggestion here is that uh, we might think about the sources of American imperialism in a different way. Um, so although like American hegemony doesn't appear on the stage until the end of the Cold War, you know, a few, my story ends in the 70s, so a few decades after that. But I think you see the roots of an American resistance to and defection from international institutions and international law beginning in this period. And it's in part a reaction to and rejection of anti-colonial world making that instigates American exit from international institutions, even the ones that they had created in the, in the post-war period. Um, so I'll just end with, if I have three more minutes, just to say some things that have come up for me since writing the book and reading people's reactions to it. Um, you know, I think one is, um, an unresolved question about the place of race in the international order. Um, 
So if you read the whole book, one thing that you might notice is that race and racial hierarchy become gradually less significant as the story moves forward. Um, um, so it's, and it's not that race disappears in, from international discussions, of course. Um, in the same period that I'm narrating, uh, there's protracted fights about apartheid uh, in South Africa in, in these same institutional contexts, especially in the UN. But in this, but as as more uh, postcolonial states are admitted into the UN and form a majority, uh, race gets increasingly detached from sovereignty itself. Um, um, so I think one question, unresolved question, is why is that, and and how how might we tell the story about race's place in the international order more generally, um, taking seriously that kind of shift. Um, Second, you know, this book celebrates uh, it, the internationalism of, of, in the age of decolonization and uh, the ways in which anti-colonial nationalists innovate new ways of thinking about international institutions. But I think there's one, you know, thing that remains um, a persistent problem about, about international order that gets reproduced in these writings, which is this um, tendency to analogize the state to the individual. Um, um, and I think um, you see this most clearly in my book in the New International Economic Order chapter, where there's an argument that the post-colonial states constitute the workers of the world. And the ways in which this move of uh, analogization to the individual, to the workers in particular, uh, may erases uh, very directly um, you know, the actual workers of the world and the workers of the world in the post colonies in particular. Um, uh, and I think related to this also is the ways that um, dependence is the primary language of critique for these set of figures in this moment. It's constantly the question of how to overcome dependence. And this is especially clear in the, again, in the Federation chapter. Um, with Nkrumah and Williams, uh, who are the you know uh, protagonists in that in that chapter, um, but uh, you know one so they want to read dependence all the way through um, that post-colonial that you know say the peasantry or and uh, the soon to be post-colonial citizens suffer from various forms of dependence that the state is dependent on the international institutions. And one wonders about um, what the ways in which the critique of dependence authorizes forms of state power and state intervention in service of liberation that end up, you know, generating forms of authoritarianism. So, um, and I think there are other ways to there are other ways to think about the problem of empire and and what the kind of uh, right way to characterize that problem might be. Um, so for instance, I think if you um, take the work of Gandhi, for instance, or you take the work of CLR James, I think these are figures who have a much more critical orientation to state power itself, uh, to, to rule and ruling as the dominant form of politics, um, which, which just leads me to a final, I'll close with this, which is, this is a book about internationalism, but it isn't one that, uh, fully elides or displaces the nation state. Um, these are all figures who are attached in various, who are statesmen. Um, so I think one of the things I think might carry this project forward is thinking about forms of anti-colonialism that are actually anti-statist as well and move beyond the state in a, in a more thoroughgoing fashion. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, look forward to hearing from Elizabeth and Andrew. Thank you so much. I will now ask uh, Dr. Vibert to enter the conversation. Thanks so much. Uh, that was a, a very uh, energizing um, overview of your book. I, I've thoroughly enjoyed reading it, and it's it's wonderful to be reminded in such a succinct way of its of its key themes. Um, and. I'm going to start by speaking to the succinct, succinctness of the book, one of, its, one of its strengths. It's astonishing. The book is so good to 
to read, which to me is not in, inconsequential at all. It's, it's beautifully written and it's written in a kind of lucid and brisk prose that, that um, makes it easy to read for lack of a better <laughs> word, but very enjoyable. Um, and astonishingly, all of you, those in the audience who haven't read the book get a sense from Adam Getachew's introduction um, and overview uh, of how much is accomplished in this book, which is a book of 180 pages. It's, it's kind of astonishing to me how much you accomplish in that, uh, in that space. Um, and yet um, in, a, in, a, in an engaging and um, really enriching kind of prose. And the book is good to read. It's good to think with on so many levels. Um, I've, been, I've been thinking a lot about imaginaries of freedom lately while writing about free black men in London after the Revolutionary War. Um, these men, already in the 1780s, had to speak to a hardened whiteness. Um, of, a, of a Burkean sort, the, the kind that Wilson was trading in in, in your book, um, Teutonic habits, English character and all of that, um, uh, views that were as profoundly gendered and classed as they, as they were raced, of course. Um, these Black men in London in the 1780s had to try to unsettle an already sturdy framework of racial understandings. Reading their words raised questions for me about Du Bois's dating of the global color line uh, to the post-emancipation US uh, and to the carve up of Africa in Berlin in the 1880s. Um, I think what you call in, in chapter one, the naturalized and stubborn picture of race, modern race, was in fact in place a good deal earlier in the empire, certainly by the late 18th century in, in pretty, substantial and immovable ways. Um, but this, as you've probably come to realize in your encounters with historians, is really a historian's quibble. We like to claim for the period that we study the signal developments uh, in the, in, you know, around the themes that we're interested in. So I'm, I'm doing that. I'm staking the, his, the historian's territory. Um, it's dispiriting uh, studying the 1780s that I should have to comment a quarter millennium later how invigorating it is to read a work of intellectual and political theory that's entirely focused on African and African diasporic thinkers and statesmen. Not that this is the first book to have that focus, that entire focus, but it's one of few that finds its way into the academy. Uh, surely this is a symptom of the unequal integration uh, that still plagues the academy and, and frankly, the world. Um, so it's exciting to think with these men's pioneering and expansive concepts of decolonization. Um, Getachew provides a compelling, sometimes surprising, and ultimately highly persuasive account of the development of these thinkers' visions. Decolonization not as mere state-making, with all the, the Western liberal inheritances that that connotes and, uh, and all the challenges laid down by imperial boundary making, but decolonization as world making. Uh, nothing less than the transformation of global political and econ economic relationships away from racialized and other hierarchies of domination. Clearly a project that's barely underway in our own time. It's really important in thinking about the book to emphasize the novelty of this sustained anti-colonial intervention. Getachew shows that these political statesmen, these, these statesmen and political thinkers didn't simply fold into an onward and upward narrative of uh, Western democratic ideals. First of all, there was no onward and upward trajectory. Freedom and justice were never granted by liberalizing institutions. They always had and they, they still have to be fought for uh, and long fought for in the face of stubborn racial hierarchies. Uh, in addition, anti-colonial nationalism was highly innovative in its critiques and its prescriptions. Um, George Padmore laid out this innovation and autonomy in Pan-Africanism. 
but he allowed that it, it, Pan-Africanism was not some self-contained kind of hermetically sealed system of thought sealed off from Western traditions. It was syncretic, it was engaging with liberal notions of human rights, with Marxism, with democratic socialism. Uh, it was a creative response related to and in tension with those traditions, and it sought to respond to particular and evolving political dilemmas. It was nimble. It was uh, contingent. Self-determination was at the center of the anti-colonial project, but self-determination, as Getachu shows us, remade and reconstituted in response to the particular legacies of imperial slavery and racism. Um, self-determination remade beyond the nation through regional and pan cooper co uh, cooperations and, and, and federalisms. This was the paradigm of self-determination uh, that became ascendant, well, always circumscribed and confined at the UN uh, in the early 70s, an explicit effort to break with the racial hierarchy, the colonial slavery that continued to shape the international order, the, an, an explicit effort to imagine a new economic order based on uh, equal, sovereign equality, material equality, not growth and hierarchy, or not always growth. This really expansive vision of decolonization was ultimately defeated by the ascendance of a liberalism that tries to dissociate itself from its roots in empire, tries to disguise those roots. A liberalism that today is laying bare in really disturbing ways, its arrangement along racial fault lines, its attachment to an overweening individualism that erases context, its privileging of individual rights at the expense of common needs and public health, its generation of grotesque economic inequalities. Getachew's book reminds us of alternative worlds and those prescient and really far-seeing thinkers who thought them. Recovering the world-making aspirations of those anti-colonialist thinkers of the Black Atlantic points to new possibilities for our present, new potentials for economic uh, and social justice in the 21st century. Um, it occurred to me while I was reading the book that we might despair today at the absence of a Du Bois, a James, a Padmore, a Nyerere on the global political stage, but I think it it depends how we envision the global political stage. We can think beyond the state makers, as, as the, 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 the statesmen, as, as you said at the end of your talk. Um, just as the political leaders and thinkers that Getachew writes about here imagined real alternatives to ramifying forms of imperialist and nationalist violence, just as they refused the deadening belief that our neo-colonial order is the only possible horizon, we do have practical visionaries today. They're in different places. Um, just to name a few of them here in the global north, which is as much a creature of colonialism as the global south, um, the decolonizing leaders of our day might be people like Autumn Peltier, uh, Greta Thunberg, uh, Opal Tomati, Tometi, sorry, um, and others who are working from below for climate justice, for racial justice, for economic justice, for gender justice. Um, these folks are world making uh, by organizing and amplifying grassroots voices, developing a whole lived repertoire of resistance. They're laying out platforms for transformation, confronting in novel ways uh, the intersecting ecological and economic and political and uh, other crises that were generated by the very violences that get to choose subjects spent their lives trying to address and overturn. We're not without agents of transformative change, but some of us, not least our um, aging male oligarchs have trouble seeing them or, or hearing them. But political theorists, including right here at UVic, our own Jim Tully uh, and Val Napoleon, have been turning their thoughts to these movements from below. Val Napoleon, following in a long line of, of feminist scholars, warns us against dismissing 
the visions and actions of subordinated people and communities as though they're pre-political, as though they somehow fall below an implicit threshold for consideration as political. In this vein, the, the anti-colonial visionaries and practitioners of our time are people like the peasants who have folded in under the auspices of La Via Campesina, um, the young indigenous and black activists in organizations and movements that have sprung up across the globe, calling for redistribution and recognition and representation, calling for transformation. I know that Adam Getachew is engaged in a number of these movements, labor, Black Lives Matter and others. Um, and I'd love to see your next book, Adam, follow on from this one and take us into those quarters of anti-colonial uh, world making. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. And now to Dr. Wender. So thank you so much, Adam, for this wonderfully provocative book. I learned so much from it. And uh, I have really wanted to talk about it with, with people. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity. And uh, thank you so much to Neelish for including me in, in the conversation. So Aidan Getachew's book offers a trenchant contribution to the ongoing deconstruction of the modernist empire to nation narrative. This from an angle whose foregrounding of the black Atlantic world effectively calls into question area studies analytic perspectives that are constrained by their tendency to presuppose the agglomeration of nation states. The projects in which this book participates are rendered all the more urgent amidst our singularly disorienting era in world history <clears throat> when the progressional thrust of the empire to nation narrative is thrown off by frenzied oscillations as well as convergences between nostalgia for empire and revanchist nationalism. We're reminded that far from being a fixed cornerstone of ostensibly civilized international order, the Westphalian state concept is merely the germinal byproduct of an early modern European consciousness consumed in the broadest sense with the demarcation of competing claims over territorial space and cosmic time. From that 17th century historical juncture, the emerging state sovereignty idea, together with the political economic systems in which it has been enmeshed, came to internalize and extend the logic of empire. This dynamic proceeded through the racialized disingenuousness of post-World War I liberal internationalist claims for self-determination, and subsequently, <clears throat> the resort of formerly colonized sovereigns, whether directly or indirectly, to statist repression and ethno-nationalist exclusionism in the name of anti-colonial necessity, a practice residually evident today in abundance. At present, the coronavirus pandemic sees the world's individual nation states ever more defensively crouched within their walls. Their inability to control the globalizing spread of a human abetted viral mutation emblematizing the illusoriness of sought imperial dominion over the world, not least for what Pankaj Mishra has termed the flailing states of Anglo-America. If COVID-19 represents the epic contingency of our time, an epidemiological analog to the assassination of the Archduke and Duchess Sophie, albeit in each instance, episodes whose occurrence, or at least their follow-ons, might have been to some extent foreseeable, then Adam Getachew further illuminates both the power of contingency and counterfactual paths remaining unexplored, once the story of foreordained Euro-American-styled self-determination has been exposed as false. Moreover, given the centrality of revolutionary and counter-revolutionary moments as decisive points of rupture within the modern historical self-imagination, it seems illustrative that pivotal opportunities arose 
when hoped for revolutions yielding fully equal political independence and economic justice were stench. When World War I gave way not to genuine post-colonial sovereignties, but rather the counter-revolutionary recasting of self-determination in the service of empire, then followed by the Cold War's transformation of possibilities like Congolese independence into sites for neo-colonial proxy war. Such figures as Nkrumah and Nyerere seized the opportunity to attempt recoding the hierarchical DNA of state sovereignty. Then too, no sooner had the new international economic order become envisioned as a means for molding a welfare world that could release newly independent post-World War II states from the economic dependency in which they found themselves entrapped than the later 20th century neoliberal counter-revolution put forth market fundamentalism as another imperial force to be overcome. The exceptional prescience, as well as the historical perspicacity, born by the persisting question of how the world might be built after empire, underscores the profound, ever-transforming degree to which this daunting task remains ours as much as it was that of the Anglophone Black Atlantic thinkers whom Getachew invokes. Of course, the movement for Black Lives has taken on intensified reverberations since the book's 2019 publication, as has the Caribbean rejoinder to colonial legacies, expressed most recently in Barbados' repudiation of the British monarchy. As for the foundational architecture of international politics, economics, and society, nothing less is at stake than the deeply contested idea and phenomenon of the international itself. On the one hand, transboundary market fundamentalism endures as a dogma of our age, with signal ironic ramifications for Africa as much as anywhere, from the role of neoliberalism in helping to create the conditions for both revolution and counter-revolution within post-2011 Egypt, to the economic and geostrategic projection of Chinese power through the Belt and Road Initiative. Simultaneously, the lockdown mentality accompanying COVID-19 has exacerbated inward turning impulses toward the nationalistic expression of state sovereignty and economic protectionism. Underscored thereby is the continuing tension and sometimes the conflation between empire, which is after all a lurking presence traveling in the wake of market fundamentalism and nation rather than any necessary progression from empire to nation. Combine in global populisms spanning from the reactionary to the radical side of the ideological ledger with their multi-form suspicion of cosmopolitan visions put forth by intellectuals and the challenge for reimagining relations between nations along more equitable lines is vast to be sure. Yet, I find a special promise in the fact that the efforts at anti-imperial world-making summoned forth by Adam Getachew are by no means too ethereally utopian. They are grounded in ethically compelling, strategically nimble responses to rapidly changing historical circumstances. More so today than even a handful of years ago, it does not appear as if the state sovereignty paradigm is going away anytime soon for better or for worse. So why not work for now to infuse the paradigm with the spirit of non-domination calibrated to the fundamental imperative of just coexistence within a pluralistic world? the as yet unknown enterprise of imagining an anti-imperial, let alone a post-imperial future for the world may become ever more conceivable. 
as we attend to rearticulating the imperial logic inscribed within the political building blocks that continue to underlie the world. Thanks so much for the uh, inspiration to, to think about your book and some of what it, it brings to bear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I would like to invite you to first respond if you would like to, to any of the comments made by, uh, by Dr. Weibert and Dr. Wender. Well, first, I just want to say thank you both so, so much. I mean, these, it's really wonderful to feel like your ideas landed and they resonated and were picked up in such, um, uh, in ways that like capture what you were trying to do. So I really, really appreciate both of you uh, for that. Um, I think I may be able to just try to say, I think four things, um, one about race, uh, the second about uh, the scalar question about how we might bring in more grassroots voices and perspectives. Um, uh, third, I think, I mean, th third, the question about the various tensions that are not fully resolved in this project around ethnicity, around nationalism, around internationalism. And then fourth, I think the strategic, the non-utopianism uh, of the project in some ways. Um, so I, <laughs> Uh, I have gotten the race, when, when did race become naturalized question before, also from a historian. So, um, you know, I think this isn't, I, all I will say about it is I think it's not a resolved, uh, it's not a fully resolved uh, story in Du Bois also, because he himself is interested in telling a backward looking story about the role of slavery in uh, generating racism and anti-black racism in particular, but also wants to open up, hold open the possibility that emancipation, not just in America, but across, not just in the United States, but across the Americas, was this moment for where there were real political possibilities um, for the incorporation of black people as citizens that got foreclosed. And those foreclosures happen at different moments across these spaces. So obviously in the um, British imperial case, this happened slightly earlier in 1834. And you might imagine the closure of that moment with Moran Bay in 1865. Um, in, in, in the US, it's really a story about recon reconstruction and what, what generated the fail failure. So I think one of the reasons to resist a story of long and deep continuity, it may be that there are, or and to make possible the, the to, make, to hold open the possibility of ruptures of the kind that reconstruction was for Du Bois, is that it, it gives us, I think, it resists a form of political pessimism about our capacities. I mean, it, 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 it holds on to historical contingency, I guess, to, to think about what are the processes what are the ways in which um, ruptures, political ruptures, can, can recalibrate and reorient uh, racial logics and racial solidarities? And what generates the moments in which those things are also foreclosed? And so I think that's why the emancipation, post-emancipation story is important to Du Bois and, um, and important to me also. Um, um, I think the second piece about you know, grassroots perspectives. I mean, I think this is in some ways the biggest downside of telling the story as I've told it is that it's a, it's, it's a story, it's kind of connected to the question of it being about an internationalism connected to the nation state is that what I've t done is take a very like pretty standard spaces like the UN and show how they were stretched in different kinds of ways. But this pri privileges, of course, very elite actors. Um, it also it also ends up, I think, making them disembodied in some ways. I mean, they're intellectually contextualized, but for many many of them are leaders of social movements and you know connected to political parties, etc. So the ways in which they're they're embedded in wider political and social formations disappears. Um, so what I'm trying to do in new work, which isn't about this period, but the earlier, an earlier period of the 1920s and 30s, um, is think through 
grassroots Black internationalism and Pan-Africanism through the example of uh, the Garveyite movement and the Universal Negro Improvement Association. Um, and there, I think, I mean, in part because these, the kinds of institutional questions I am concerned with in this book, they're not really on the table in the 1920s and 30s. There's this real concern and preoccupation with movement building, with how you, how you inculcate forms of political empowerment, et cetera, at the, you know, on the ground level. And so it's been really interesting for me to begin to do that work and very different from the kind of thing I normally do. So it's exciting and hopefully it will, hopefully it will counterbalance this kind of high politics perspective with, with something more grassroots. Um, um, you know, um, Andrew raised a, a number of questions about, I think, I think one, I, I mean, I guess another sort of limit of the book, and I think this will be most frustrating for especially theorists of the post-colonial, post-colonial theorists more generally, who have spent many decades recounting the, like a deep criticism of anti-colonial nationalism, is that this may be ultimately too um, too romantic or too attached to the kind of nationalism as a kind of emancipatory project. Um, and, you know, I think, so I guess I, I would just say, I think one of the, I do think that's a real limit of the book, given its orientation to the international, it does, it deals much less with the sort of ways in which this project, I mean, it gestures towards them at various moments, like the Afro and, and the Congo and other contexts, but it doesn't really give us a full account about why this, why this fell apart on the inside, um, from the inside, from within. And that is work, I mean, I hope to do as well. Um, you know, I think on this, I am like a real, I, I just reread uh, Mahmoud Mamdani's Citizen and Subject from 1996, and I think that that's it's such a powerful account about um, why this project, uh, an emancipatory project, one that uh, was a kind of partial project because it like largely left intact the structure of rule. Um, around the bifurcated state and, and the ways that that generates uh, ge both keeps in place forms of despotism, but then also generates new forms of kind of ethnic confrontation and violence. Um, and I think this is why I was also at the end of my brief remarks suggesting we might look for other kinds of sources for people who had different imaginations of what the problem of empire was that really get much closer to the to the kind of contemporary dilemmas of the post-colonial context, um, which to be sure, of course, this the kind of questions of hierarchy and inequality in the international stage are still important. Um, but it seems to me that the most pressing concerns with for people are about, are what's happening in, within the states, right? With the rise of, of authoritarianism or or ethnic violence. I mean, my family is from Ethiopia. And this is, I mean, no one, none of my family members are super preoccupied with Ethiopia standing on the world stage right now, but they're very preoccupied with the fact that, you know, there, it feels like, you know, we're on the precipice of civil war. So, you know, I think um, thinking more about what, what were the sor sources of these forms of the entrenchment of identity, um, I think, Related to that, I think in some ways, um, one thing I would like to do is also think that, I mean, it may not have just been nationalism that generated this set of problems, right? Um, or that it's also about the ways in which the nationalist project was a democratic and democratizing project. It's, and partly like what generates these forms of mobilization, ethnic mobilization, has to do with majoritarianism and, and the ways in which democratic legitimation based on the mobilization of majorities is really got that kind of project and vision of democracy did get universalized in this moment. Uh, so it's also to kind of problematize other kinds of categories in, in the process of thinking about the post-colonial condition. Um, 
And then the last thing I'll say is, I mean, I think how you put it around the kind of the strategic character of this project is really, it's really, um, it's really right. Like that's how I think of the project. And I think in some ways, um, it is true. I mean, you might lose something about a kind of more utopian imagination of what's possible. But what I especially appreciate about this set of figures, especially from our own vantage point where things look very bleak and it's hard to figure out what space of maneuver there is. Um, what I like about their imagination is to try and use the resources you have, you know, even when they, those resources don't look on their face to be supportive of your project, that you could use those resources in service of other kinds of ends. And here I'm thinking especially about, you know, in 1945 when Du Bois and Ezekwe and all these figures are like, the UN is just going to do, it's the same thing as the League from our perspective, but yet um, they try to engage that process. And I mean, partly they don't really have much choice. They can't exit that system, right? But, but I think there's this, real openness to the possibility of transformation from within. And I don't think we should all be trying to transform institutions from within. I think it's important that some people are on the outside and have more utopian and imaginations. But I wanted to recover this possibility from, for thinking from within, for pivoting from one moment of, when one moment of openness closes down to pivoting to another kind of imagination. Um, and so forth. So yeah, I think that really captures one lesson I hope this book um, generates. And it's also a way of thinking about political theory as a more real, realist enterprise in some way, uh, less a kind of normative theorization, but one that tries to build from the place we're at and, and try to build up from that. Oh, I'm happy to take other questions. Thank you so much for that. I just wanted to say a few words as, as quickly as I can that uh, thank you to Dr. Weibert and Dr. Winder for wonderful uh, insights on the broader topic, some of the issues that I uh, took that as Dr. Gedachu also mentioned, um, are a critique of a progressive view of history from empire to nation, which is I think uh, running through from the beginning of this program and the book, um, as was mentioned in the beginning, uh, taking from the view of the, the Libyan uh, intervention and trying to think about longer term continuities, but also a contingent nature of how certain critiques emerge. And I, and I think that's a very apposite moment and, and, and point to think about bigger issues. Um, and then uh, the historicization of race and empire, um, both of those points, I think, are uh, you know, very powerful to think with in different directions. Um, I have a variety uh, of thoughts that I wanted to share, but I'm going to resist those and, and share the questions. Uh, there are three questions at present, and there's two uh, that also speak to some of my interests um, as I was listening about the state and uh, an anti-statist and non-statist figures, um, and whether or not there are critiques of a statist order, and I think this was mentioned at you know, different points today, uh, that are recoverable. And, and were, the, were critiques of both uh, the nature of a statist order as well as the nation state itself, are those uh, coming from very contingent moments or are those broader lessons that can be applied? Um, uh, one of the questions mentions uh, which figures are uh, in the language of the question, anti-statist figures and how we think about the legacy of anti-statist figures. And then another question is, what are the non-state, um, the non-state centric world order, let's say, what would that look like or how, how does that uh, come together? Um, I think those, those are the two questions on that theme that I'll, I'll, I'll pose to you um, for now. Yeah. That's a great, uh, it's a great question. I mean, I have, I don't know what the answer, especially to the second one is around what it would look like to a world order with no states. I mean, um, yeah, I'm, yeah, so I, I'm not quite sure 
have an answer to that. But I think in terms of the anti-state or non-statist anti-colonialism, as I said, the figure probably most best known to us as is, is, I mean, Gandhi has a very thoroughgoing critique of the modern state and sees the colonial, in part because he sees the colonial state not as a, you know, divergence or pathological form of the state, but just that is the modern state is to be coercive. And, and so there's, I think also there is similar, you know, CLR James in later writing, um, I mean, CLR James briefly is in the, you know, in Williams's Nationalist Party. He's um, a supporting the Federalist Project, but especially in beginning with a book he writes in 62, 63, Party Politics in the West Indies. There is this worry that, I mean, part of the problem with the post-colonial state is that it's, re it's reinforced politics as basically a politics is rule and ruling. And so it has this structure of hierarchy and inequality embedded in it. It hasn't fully overcome that structure. So if he wants to think about, I mean, non, um, I don't know if he, ha he doesn't have an institutional vision in the same way that um, Gandhi and Indian Federalists were thinking about the village form, but, but diff a more kind of, um, horizontal ways of doing politics, a way of doing, he also, this is a moment in which he's very interested in ancient ancient Greece and possibilities for direct forms of democracy that are not representative. Um, so those two figures come to mind. Um, in, the, in the Caribbean, I mean, sorry, in the African context, I think there are, you know, I mean, so in Ghana, for instance, uh, there, there is a kind of countervailing project against the Nkrumah state about Ashanti nationalism and thinking through models of confederal confederation within Ghana. This is also the origins of Katanga secession is an attempt to think about decentralized forms of federalism. I mean, um, Moise Tshambe, who's like the leader of the Katanga secession, is similarly reading the federalist and anti-federalist papers strikingly and thinking about if, if for Nkrumah, he's interested in 1787. is interested in the con confederation moment before the before federation actually happens. Thinking again of a more decentralized form of rule. I mean, I think from the perspective of the um, the you know the modernizers, uh, i.e., people like Nkrumah, these were all forms of atavistic you know attachments to you know forms of native authority that were non-democratic, et cetera. But I think from, I mean, from our perspective, we know that the project of trying to eliminate by fiat uh, these alternative structures of rule didn't, didn't work, right? It, you couldn't just build out citizens from, from this aspiration. So, you know, one thought, one thought might be, were there possibilities of trying to think how these structures might have been democratized from within. And this is, of course, Mahmoud Mandani's point, this isn't a subject to. But maybe I'll put this, there's a new, a, slight, a pretty new article, um, which is a sort of review essay by a woman, Merve Fachula, I'll just put it in the chat, um, called The Historiography of, um, Historiography of Federalism, that just overviews all the work on federalism and suggests a few possibilities within the African context for thinking about non-statist or decentralizing models of federalism. Um, uh, so it might be useful for the person who asked. On that note, uh, since that issue has been brought up, and there's another question that I will get to in just a few seconds, but uh, on the notion of federation, which, uh, which you, you raised, this brings to light a bigger um, insight in the book, which is about the appropriability and malleability of certain precedents and concepts, one being self-determination, which of course, in some circles is seen as, uh, you know, a liberation uh, and an emancipation. It may be seen as the source by which a certain kind of domination occurs, as you show with Wilson and Jan Smuts. Also, there's a very interesting nature of the appropriation of the United States as a, as a precedent for federations conceptually and, and in, in practice. And uh, 
And I'm wondering if you could speak a bit about that broader point historically and conceptually, or perhaps with the specific material that you work with, what are the resources from those precedents and the limits of those precedents, especially vis-a-vis -vis the present? Yeah. Um, uh, thanks for that question. I mean, I think this also ties to one thing Elizabeth said earlier about um, one aspiration of this book is to try and think about anti-colonial nationalism as a site of conceptual and political innovation. But so I want to say two things about that, though. Um, one is that I resist and reject the idea that these are figures who are um, non-Western figures, right, who are working and operating within a tradition that's like somehow not outside of the West, right? I mean, there are many ways they aren't. Obviously, they're all educated in Britain and the US, just to take one very basic biographical feature. But also, I really take on board a kind of David Scott's view of, 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 of conscripts of modernity, the idea that part of what the project of being an, or part of what it meant to be an imperial subject was to be embedded in the terms and logics of, you know, the, um, of modernity. Um, uh, so for me, though, that taking on board that framework does not necessarily mean that the, that everything was written for them in advance, right? That all they could do was mimic, echo, and and take up the language and terms as they as as they were as it was given to them. Um, so one of the so the idea for me of a, an appropriation that generates innovation is is one that's like trying to, to take seriously the ways in which um, these figures may be thought of as conscripts of European modernity, but also see them as ones that that. Um, creatively think through their their colonial in inheritance. Um, colonial inheritance is a language that Stuart Hall uses in his new, or not now new, but recent uh, uh, autobiographical work, A Familiar Stranger. And it's, I think, very productive to think of the set of figures dealing, reckoning with various forms of a colonial inheritance. Of course, there's the material and political conditions of the spaces from which they're trying to liberate, but also an intellectual inheritance and in the ways in which um, their orientations are structured by um, European political thought, European political experience, Euro-American political experiences. On the specific question about the, uh, you know, the appropriation of the American uh, example of federation, I mean, I think this example in some ways illuminates so many moments of creativity, right? For instance, uh, it's um, one that uh, reads the U.S. as as having, I mean, it, it depathologizes the condition of the third world, right? By saying, this isn't the, the, the kinds of dilemmas we are facing in our moment are actually universal ones that even the premier nation of the world faced too, right? So it universalizes through the analogy. Um, I, and it, yeah, it, it overcomes or tries to push back against the language of cultural or sociological deficit in the third world. It's also one in which there is a reading of 1787 and the Federalists, but it's being read through and for the purposes of generating a particular kind of state, um, which is really the new, I mean, if there's any proximate American model, it's not 1787, it's the New Deal state with powers of taxation, with robust federal powers, et cetera. So there's this kind of, um, and it's not, it's an appropriation that we might say is, um, they're not, the, they're like, uh, a strategic appropriation, right? One that uses the significance of that moment that, um, and the significance of the United States and the world order for, for the purposes of a particular kind of, of, of imagination. But I, as I say, it's not one that's, I mean, it's many things about the analogy don't really work. Um, one, just, it, you know, in part because they already know, they've already decided, right, that a strong federal state is what they need. 
in order to overcome their problem, they've already decided that federation is a mechanism for the aggregation of power rather than for the, the distribution of, and disaggregation of power in the ways that not subnational um, groups are demanding, right? And this is the kind of Merve Fajula's point is, there was another vision of federation that could have been about decentralizing and redistributing power rather than concentrating power. Um, but most importantly, I think the I think the the most important blind spot of the analogy is that it doesn't take seriously that what America was was not a, just a federation. It was a, a federation structured for the purposes of settle, settler colonialism. Um, and I think so. I want to acknowledge that limit, but one of the things I try to suggest is I don't think the, their federal project failed because their they used a bad analogy. You know, I don't think the, the analogy. I think there were limits to it, but I don't think that generates the failure. I think there are other reasons. I mean, perhaps the thing that most generates the failure is an attachment to federation as a structure of aggregation rather than you know, redistribution of power. That, that leads to, uh, well, many different discussions that I think could be had about the limits of normative uh, political theory that you mentioned in the beginning um, and the ways of reading history that you also mentioned that, that has been mentioned in different forms here. Uh, because there's little time, I want to get to the next question, which is related uh, to this. Um, and I'll just read it out. Uh, do you think the shift from re focusing on redistribution to transitional justice, and this is something you mentioned at the very end um, of your work, um, and the individual, uh, is a result of pressure from hegemonic powers, and then the question is written in parentheses, capital, exerting influence on such demands? Yeah, I mean, uh, Nilesh, you also asked earlier about where I thought this kind of or reorientation came from. I mean, I want to I want to resist a reading of this where this is all um, imposed from the outside in. I think there, you know, in the seventies moment, there are lots of internal um, figures internal to the post-colonial project uh, who. Um, who 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 felt like the developmental project was shipwrecked? You know, it w it did not generate the kinds of results that people wanted. So, for instance, um, the the shift to more sufficiency or arguments for sufficiency or what would become the basic needs approach were also being articulated from within within these terms within these um, states. I'll just give one quick example of this um, when. Michael Manley is in power in 1972. Orlando Patterson serves as his special advisor. And, you know, he makes this, this compelling argument for giving up on the idea of just trying to build new housing projects, right? Building from scratch a, a kind of a model of the modern apartment, you know, with two bedrooms and everything. And he's like, we, these are urban spaces with tons of slums, with tons of irregular housing. And we're never going to be able to house everybody in that model of the apartment, right? So are there ways we can just improve for what we have, right? Uh, urban upgrading is the program. Um, and I think that's an example of the why, in they, this is another moment of strategic ad adaptation or something like that an encounter with the failures and limits of an internal project uh, of development and modernization also compels a turn to these alternative strategies uh, from within the post-colonial world. There are other examples of, of the same kind of thing across, across the sphere. Um, I think transitional justice is the same too in the sense that, you know, one place that transitional justice comes from is an attempt to reckon with these forms of harm and violence within states um, without recourse, uh, sometimes without recourse to say a criminal a criminal procedure or criminal responsibility as the ideal and model. So I, I mean, there are obviously also pressures from without. I mean, um, if, you, if you've read um, Sam Moyne's most recent book, uh, uh, Not Enough, Human Rights in an Unequal World, 
he makes a very strong case about especially you know the um uh, the, an, an anxiety for third world states in the 1970s that um, basic needs, human rights were being pressed on them in the moment that they're asking for a radical redistribution of wealth, right? So there is also a kind of uh, a way in which those um, perspectives are being pushed by external actors. Um, and then I, I think Jessica White's more, more recent book, uh, Morals of the Market, makes an even more stronger case than Sam Wayne does for the intersection and reproduction of neoliberalism and human rights. Well, would you place, I mean, as you mentioned, the tragic nature uh, of this, the story that you are offering, that the ultimate causal forces, although as a work of political theory, it is not uh, positioned in the same way that a, a history of the 20th century would be positioned necessarily, but there is a trace of the causal forces here being the uh, broader global uh, external uh, forces as opposed to either a diffusionist account of how individuals reacted or to find the failures within. There's, there's a, a broader agency outside of and external to uh, the figures that you are studying that lead to the end of this uh, vision, let's say. Mm -hmm. And and I'm wondering if you could speak a bit a bit more about it. You just did mention that, that is, is this the bigger, one of the bigger takeaways of how the vision of world making uh, uh, declined or, or fell? Yeah, I mean, I'm reluctant to say that the external hierarchy was the causal force. I, I want to insist on an, a more interactive reading of the domestic and the or the internal contradictions and the external, um, you know, uh, processes. You know, one could say at a basic level, like the the United States and its allies was was never going to we're never going to sign on to the NIEO or something like that. So. At, maybe at that kind of level, especially around the NIEO, you could say that the forces were such that they were arrayed against this project. But even there, I mean, you, historians of the U.S. In, in the world show the ways in which, especially after the OPEC oil price hike, there was a real sense of fear on the part of the United States and European states and the desire to make some form of concession to third world demands. I don't think it may not have gotten them all of the NIEO, but it would have gotten them closer had it not been for the ways that um, the debt, the like fallout of the oil crisis in the debt crisis of, of the third world didn't radically shift, you know, the bargaining chips in, in, against the third world. But let me say something a little bit about what I mean by a more interactive approach. I mean, I think we can't say that, say, for instance, something like why didn't the Federation project get realized? I don't think you can tell a story in which, in that context, in which the defeat is all about uh, external actors and, and global he hegemony playing out, right? This is a, no one, no, there, there isn't that sort of possibility there. I mean, it could be that, say, structural features about how these countries are positioned vis-a-vis -vis each other raise the bar for how to, how to create regional integration. But I would, I want to say that I think that failure is really an internal failure. Um, and I, let me say why I think it's important to, to account for internal failure. It's because I think, one, I think it's important not, I mean, to say that power is always being exercised from without is to rob the third world of any agency, right? And to be an agential actor is also to be able is to be to sometimes fail at the things you do and to take responsibility for failure. So I think it's important, you know, in that broader vision of of, of trying to think about the agency of these figures and and this and this form of politics to think that there were things they could have done differently and that that they may have they had some room for for realizing some parts of their projects, even if they were hemmed in from without. Um, so to me, that's really important. And it's, it's connected to the contingency point. I mean, if it is really the case that we live in a world in which 
power is constantly being exercised and constantly blocking all possibility for transformation, then I know it's a pretty, it's an even bleaker picture, I think. I, I'll say one other thing. I think what makes a story tragic is in part when there's actors who who fail, you know, who 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 have the capacity for agency and who are unable to fully realize their um, ambitions. And like part of it is how we learn from those tragic heroes. Uh, yes, and and also the expansiveness of the vision, uh, which uh, helps us understand, I think, the uh, the richness also of the tragedy um, as well as the nature of. A failure. I think we are at our time, so I'm going to stop this session at this point and thank uh, our speakers and thank everybody uh, for joining us. It was a wonderful uh, discussion. Thank you.